Hey, all right, everyone, it's two o'clock, so we're gonna get started. I'm gonna give an introduction to Kenny Daniel. He's been in academics with AI. He's been a practitioner in industry. And most recently, he's founded Algorithmia. He studied AI in Carnegie Mellon and Southern California. And today he's gonna to give a talk on some of the DevOps issues with ML. If you have any questions, uh, post them in the chat. And just like uh, David mentioned, uh, put a Q colon at the start of them and, and Kenny can get to them at the end of the chat. Without further ado, here's Kenny. Great. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Patrick, for the introduction. Um, yeah, as he said, going to talk about uh, DevOps and as, how it applies to the, to the world of machine learning based on you know my years of experience in the, in the field. Um, so the introduction out of the way, we can just dive right into it. Um, so just to start with, and you know, to, to, to kind of get everybody on the same page, I want you to think if you're starting a project, uh, and it could be any project, it could be, you know, just a side project for fun, it could be, you know, a new project at an enterprise or founding a startup that's gonna have some component of ML uh, that, that you're gonna wanna deploy. And the question I want you to think is, you know, how would I actually go about deploying this model? And there's a number of ways that you can approach this um, and, you know, different approaches, things that have different pros and cons. Uh, but, you know, what I think I'm going to argue, especially in this talk, is that, you know, there's, we need to figure this out as an industry uh, and, you know, figure out what are the best practices, what are, what are the procedures for doing this. So the big thing, you know, this is something that I think is critical to our industry. Um, you know, I, I've been in this industry for a while now and, you know, lived through the AI winter, uh, so to speak. And uh, in my opinion, the reason that that happened to a large extent was that there was a lot of interest and excitement around AI and machine learning, uh, but people failed to get return on investment. Um, you know, companies invested in it. Companies are, a lot of companies are investing now. And if you don't get success with these projects if you don't deliver return on investments you know enable things that couldn't have been done without machine learning uh or save you know huge amounts of money by automating things you know if we don't achieve those things as an industry uh, i think there's an existential risk of you know funding decreasing and and you know setting back progress and i think you know we're all here and wanting the same thing of you know more and better tools and technology so that's why I really want to emphasize that, you know, just doing machine learning is not the same thing as doing machine learning in production. And there's a whole bunch of things uh, that go into why that's not the same thing. So probably don't need to tell anybody at this conference this, but, you know, DevOps broadly, uh, you know, I like to think of it as a set of practices intended to reduce the time uh, from, you know, wanting to make a change to actually getting that in production in the hands of your of your customers and your users. And, you know, this, we have over, you know, a decade or two decades or, or however long of applying DevOps to traditional software. Uh, but this is very new uh, concept in the world of machine learning. So I'm very excited to have conferences like this one, uh, you know, talking about sort of the challenges that, that go into that. Uh, so, Again, broadly, you know, the, the, the theme of the talk is drawing analogy between traditional software development lifecycle and machine learning, uh, because there's a lot to learn. And if there's an unspoken subtitle of this talk, it's, you know, why does machine learning industry suck at DevOps, frankly? <laughs> um, and, you know, we, if you were to go start a company or start a project in, uh, in you know, building a web app or a traditional sort of software project, uh, and you said, you know, yeah, I think all this source control management stuff, uh, CI, CD, uh, testing, uh, you know, uh, you know, observability, all these things. If you just said, oh, you know, I don't need those. That 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 seems overhyped. Uh, I'm just going to go it alone. I'm just going to, you know, commit straight to master. I'm going to, uh, you, know, do, you know, do all these things and ignore all these best practices. Frankly, you'd be laughed out of the room. Um, you know, there's a reason why these things are best practices. It doesn't mean you implement them all at once, but like if you weren't working towards that, uh, you know, you wouldn't be setting yourself up for success. And so in, in all of my time in, in the world of machine learning, uh, you know, in academia, never once mentioned source control. Uh, you know, even then, even still today, uh, you know, we see Fortune 500 companies out there that have teams of data scientists uh, that aren't even source controlling uh, their, their training code or their, their code for inference. 
And that seems crazy, frankly. Um, and a lot of the tooling is not really set up super well for that, uh, you know, as for example, Jupiter and things like that. Um, so let's dive a little bit deeper in, into the sort of this idea. And so the software development lifecycle, for those those not familiar, uh, there, there's a lot of number of de possible definitions and things that this encompasses. But broadly speaking, you know, it's it's the things that are, are table stakes for software development. Uh, control management, get their winner in that regard. Uh, CICD, uh, you know, everybody's got their favorite tool of choice of, you know, Jenkins or GitLab or Hub Actions or wh whatever it is. Um, but again, you know, this this is ubiquitous. This is in every company these days. Um, you know, how do you how do you automate the deployment? Um, you know, rather, it shouldn't be a person at a keyboard sitting there, you know, manually uploading things or running commands. You know, that that's uh, it doesn't sit, doesn't fit with compliance, but it, it's also just not good for developers or, or for the company, and it and it inhibits moving quickly. And so, uh, you know, having solutions for that is going to be really key. Um, and similarly, you know, there, and especially now, like this is uh, in the world of DevOps, the really big thing is, you know, how do you get observability? How do you get insight and introspection into the running system so that you can diagnose things and debug things and, and understand what's going on with your live systems? So I would argue that, you know, we need to be asking ourselves as an industry, you know, what are the analogies for those things in, in the machine learning world? Um, some of them translate pretty directly. Um, you know, as I was saying, you know, I, I'm definitely an advocate of source controlling and, and checking in your code for both training and for inference. Um, but, you know, for CI, CD, um, there, there's kind of some unique requirements in, in these worlds. And we'll dive into this more in the rest of the talk. But uh, that's what I want to kind of start getting, getting everybody thinking is, you know, what what are the you know what are the analogy of tests and continuous distribution and integration in the world of machine learning and how can we level up as an industry on those tools? So it it, it there are differences. Um, you know, machine learning has fundamentally different characteristics in some ways uh, to traditional workloads. Some of which are compute related. Uh, others are just in terms of this life cycle. And you know. Uh, Agile development and software development, it's all about building feedback loops. And you know, you you push code, you test it, you see how it runs, uh, and then you know you go back and you iterate it and you update it next week or the next day. Um, machine learning is similar, but there's an extra step in a certain sense because there's the training phase and which is distinct from the actual sort of inference phase. Uh, but you do want feedback loops through this whole thing. Uh, there's also uh, the aspect that uh, the the, the output of a machine learning model does not depend just on the code you write. It depends on the model and the weights and, and the, you know, the, the output of the training. And so that, that's another consideration where even if your code hasn't changed at all, it's the same git hash. If the model changes out from underneath it, uh, you know, that's going to have a different output. And so any pipelines and, and life cycles that you build have to be aware of this and, 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 you know, build that into the understanding. Um, uh, so this is a concept that I really like is just, and this is core to the to DevOps really, is speed of iteration is everything. Um, and this was not invented by agile software developers or it wasn't even invented in the last couple decades. Uh, you know, this was observed, you know, even back in the 1950s uh, in the context of dogfighting aircraft uh, where, and this was the uh, Boyd was a general um, and who was studying uh, sort of academically uh, how to be more effective at, at, at you know aerial fighting, and he realized that uh, basically the speed of iteration beats quality of iteration every time. And so, if you can adapt and, and improvise more quickly than anyone else, you know that's really going to be key to success, even if each individual step is you know not as good uh this is pretty widely accepted in sports and software engineering you know this is not controversial these days uh, but achieving that is has got to be key to you know machine learning success so i want to dive a little bit deeper into kind of each of what i'll call the four stages of uh, machine learning life cycle here um i'm not gonna the first stage is the data um everybody knows that there's gonna be plenty of talks uh, in this conference about that uh, i'm actually gonna mostly not talk about this at all just because it is such a deep topic and i want to talk about the later stages uh but there is lots to be said about data um you know the the, the quote putting here is that you know for decades really you know people have built 
acquiring data, accumulating data through big data, data lakes, all these things. Um, but you know, again, going back to the original point, if you don't get return on investment on that data, uh, you know, then there's going to be backlash and, and it's not going to be good for anybody, really. You know, people spent millions and millions of dollars accumulating this data. And what they're realizing now is that if you don't have machine learning and algorithms to make sense of that data, uh, then then piling up all that data is useless. Um, but similarly, you know, machine learning algorithm is not any good on its own. It needs to be paired with data. It needs to be paired with the right use case. Uh, and, and, you know, that and it needs to be able to access that and and take that into consideration. So there's a lot to be said there, but I'm going to gloss over that for this talk. Uh, so training. So training is a phase that doesn't even exist in the, in the traditional software engineering life cycle. So uh, it, it's worth addressing a little bit. Um, and characteristically, training uh, is obviously very different than the deployment and running and inference. Um, it's very long compute cycle. It's exploratory. Um, the training is very often done on, you know, somebody's laptop running Jupyter Notebook. It's an interactive uh, REPL type environment. Uh, you know, you want to be experimenting with features. You want to be, be iterating and, 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 you know, doing it quickly and having a fast feedback loop there is absolutely critical. Um, you know, I talk a little bit, it, it's not a perfect analogy, but it, it's very stateful in a certain sense that even if you're, you know, training across, uh, you know, a distributed compute cluster, uh, there's still sort of a central job being run that's being orchestrated um, and you you know you can paralyze things but like in a certain sense it, it's a one-off or it may be uh, run for for hours or days or weeks uh, at once or a couple times but then there's a distinct transition from that uh, training phase into production which is characterized by um, in many cases you know it depends on the use case but being almost completely stateless uh, when you're actually doing the inference you know you take an input and you output a classification or uh, what you know, whatever the the category of ML problem is, but uh, you can parallel. It's embarrassingly parallel is the technical term for it, right? You know, you can just copy it, replicate it horizontally, uh, and handle as many results as you want that way. Uh, in contrast to training, um, and you know, it there, it's going to be bursty. It's you can't necessarily predict uh, the usage patterns on inference training. Like I said, it's going to be you know once or a couple times off. It's going to be very heavy. Uh, you know running and, and inference and production that could be following Monday through nine to Monday through Friday, nine to five. There might be monthly or nightly batch updates that have a really huge spike in traffic. So, you know, these are very different characteristics that are considered when, you know, you might want to choose the best tool for each job. Uh, and the more important and bigger and more valuable a project is the more you want to find uh, the best tool for the job. So, how do we bridge that gap between training and production? Um, so as I was saying earlier, you know, first of all, source control and Git is, is not even ubiqu as ubiquitous as I think it should be in, in our industry. But in the place where it is, you know, there's also this, this issue where the code that runs the training is different than the code that hosts it. So there's a question of how do you manage those two distinct uh, phases? Um, and you know, one of the things I, I'm a big fan of personally uh, is what I call the, the two Git flow system. Um, this is kind of drawing an analogy. There, there's there's a uh, Git. There's things called like Git flow, which is just best practices for how do you work with Git? What do you name your branches? How do you merge things in? And collaborate with other people. Um, so I would argue, we, you know, we should. And this may not be the way, but we should be talking as an industry, you know, how do we manage this? Is there a training repo that's distinct from uh, the inference repo? I would argue yes, um, because, the, you know, they operate under different life cycles. Uh, but there's other ways you can do it, um, you know, having different directories within the same repo, things like that. Um, but it, it's absolutely something that I, I don't see talked about in, enough, in my opinion. Um, so how do you then go from, you know, training? So say I have, I'm working in Jupyter Notebook, it's interactive, uh, you know, Jupyter is not a hosting solution. Um, it's, it's, it, it's just not, I mean, it's interactive, it's, it's an environment really. Um, it goes a bit beyond that, but, but at its core, it's meant for that interactive sort of exploratory phase. Um, so, you know, there's a couple ways that you can go seamlessly from there. And I'm definitely an advocate of, having this be as automated as possible. So one thing that I've seen that's really effective is let your data scientists work uh, in Jupyter Notebooks that, that they want to be working in. Check them into source control 
And you can, with pretty minimal boilerplate code or with configuration of your CI system, depending on what that system is, uh, you can make it so that when a data scientist pushes up a notebook uh, that they've trained on, uh, you can very easily have it execute that notebook in a container uh, and with you know minimal sort of boilerplate at the end or through through configuration of CI, have it train the model on a cloud potentially like as a result of the, a CI event. And then when it's done, push the model up to a hosting platform. Um, this can be overkill in some cases, but I would argue that it's a lot better than the situation of, oh, I trained a model on my laptop. I'm gonna take this pickled model file, I'm gonna manually drag it up to S3 uh, and then configure you know, a web app to use that. Uh, the problems with that, and especially if you get into you know, industries uh, that, are, that are more regulated or even just just more valuable use cases, uh, you know, you need compliance. You need to ensure that, you know, one person can't single-handedly, uh, you know, manipulate that model or, or even just make, an, make a careless oversight. Um, you know, that's why we need sort of these tools and these best practices is in order to prevent that, that human element from, from causing problems there. Um, so ML deployment also has some unique challenges. You know, you might ask the question, well, if we've spent, one, two decades of building all these, these tools and solutions for deploying software and web applications and services, you know, why not just use them? Um, well, the sort of obvious one, or at least one of the biggest issues there is that there's pretty unique hardware requirements, for example, uh, GPUs. Um, this is not universally the case, but for a pretty large amount of uh, machine learning workloads, especially anything that's gonna be deep you neural know, network related, of course, um, you need a, you you frankly need specialized hardware in order to be competitive, uh, and sometimes it's GPUs, it might be TPUs or other ASICs that are coming out and all that. But but fundamentally, uh, there's a question of how do you do that? And if you're, for example, you might say, hey, I already have a Kubernetes cluster that's running, you know, for my web services and my web apps. We have a whole team dedicated to, to maintaining and running that. Why can't I just do it there? Well, you can, but there's that, you know, there's questions of, do I put a GPU on all of my machines there? Uh, you know, how do I start segregating this to make sure that the workloads are going where I want to go? Uh, and furthermore, uh, containerization is something I haven't talked about too much, but it, it's, you know, very front and center uh, in the minds of people. And again, with DevOps, you know, that's pretty standard these days. If you're not containerizing your traditional workloads, it's going to be very difficult to work with them, um, broadly speaking. Uh, with machine learning, it's it's doubly difficult in that regard. So what, what I'm kind of showing here is if you have two Docker containers running on the same machine, uh, they, it's not completely two isolated things the way it is if those were running in two separate VMs. Uh, when you're running two things in Docker containers on the same machine, they share the same kernel. And anything that lives in that kernel space is not going to be cleanly segregated using Docker and using cgroups. And what lives in the kernel? Well, for relevant to us, most importantly, is going to be things like GPU drivers and hardware drivers uh, and CUDA and, and all that. And so suddenly it's not just what you put in your Docker container. It's also what lives in the host uh, VM uh, that's that's underlying this. And so it's not enough uh, to, to just use an off-the-shelf uh, container or Kubernetes system. You now need to be doing things like bind mounting in uh, the NVIDIA Docker sockets in order to make it so that your containerized workloads can, can even make use of the hardware. Uh, and then furthermore, there's the question of, okay, great, you know, even if you do those things, uh, how do you prevent them from stepping, how do, workload one from stepping on workload two? Uh, and the fact of the matter is, is that GPU don't have uh, the kind of memory protections and, and boundaries and security boundaries that uh, system memory does. Uh, things are starting to get better in that world, but fundamentally GPUs were made to make video games fast, not to run enterprise production workloads uh, in, in multi-tenant environments. Oh, clicker's not clicking. Um, you know, again, going kind of into the, the unique challenges that ML presents uh, for deployment, uh, there's pretty heavy framework. So even if you get the CUDA and the CUDA and the drivers and all that worked out, uh, you know, TensorFlow, uh, PyTorch, you know, all these things are in many cases multi-gigabyte affairs. And so there's a question of, you know, how do you efficiently deploy those and make sure that everything works nicely together? Uh, and, you know, sometimes, you, you know, you can just do that with a pip install, uh, but in other cases, it, it's not that simple. And 
there's also, if you want to deploy a lot of these things, if every one of them uh, creates a new Docker container baked from scratch, uh, each one of those is going to be really large. And if you're not careful about how you construct those, uh, they're not going to have shared common layers. And so suddenly, you need to spend a lot more time and a lot more disk space downloading uh, and loading and, and extracting and uh, all, all these containerized models. And if you do that, it's going to reduce your efficiency, your utilization of your hardware. And it's, you know, it's also going to affect your scaling because if it takes a long time to spin up another replica because you have to spend two minutes downloading a Docker container, um, you need more overhead in that world. Uh, Cause if, if you can spin up really fast, uh, you don't need as much slack overhead when you have unpredictable workloads, because if you can spin up in seconds, then, you, you can just respond to demand dynamically. But if, it, if you know that it's going to take two minutes, three minutes, five, four minutes, whatever, uh, to load up a new replica, you'd need to have more slack capacity if you don't want to be dropping requests or, or failing to keep up with demand. Uh, so that's, that's really critical is, you know, being efficient with how you design your base layers and deploy them out to your, to your working mach worker machines. Um, and this gets even more complicated as you get into the world of things like natural language processing, where you're often going to be pipelining uh, lots of different components together. You know, first step might be, you know, converting uh, a, a PDF to text so that we can even start to work on it. Um, but even from there, you know, you need to know what language it is. You probably want to vectorize the text um, and, you know, do all of these transformations. And so being able to combine them and make sure that, uh, you know, when you have multiple containers that want to, you know, send data from one to the other, that is your scheduling system making sure that those run near each other. Um, and, and things like that can make a huge impact on the performance, the overhead, and, and the throughput of your machine learning system. Um, so, okay, after you deploy it, what then? Uh, well, there's management. And in many cases, a lot of companies haven't even gotten to this uh, stage of, of machine learning maturity, uh, but it's absolutely something that's looming on the horizon. And there's a number of things that go into that. And again, if you look at a modern, uh, you know, DevOps or, or infrastructure uh, department in a company, uh, they're working on a whole bunch of things. They're working on testing, uh, but we're, we'll go into that in a minute. But, there, you know, there's multiple kinds of testing that you want to do it. Uh, there's, there's the, you know, getting insight into the system and all that. So uh, these are things which may often be forgotten in the early stages where the only goal is just, hey, I have this model. I need to get and I need to get it available as an API or as part of our, our you know, backend pipeline um, so that we can actually start getting results and getting return on investment. But pretty quickly what will happen, um, you know, as soon as you want to update that model or, you know, add a second model or, you know, retrain uh, on a nightly basis or just update based on new data is, you know, you'll have these questions of how do I manage that going forward? Um, so there, there's things like testing. This is on this slide kind of the what, what machine learning practitioners often think of as testing and evaluation is these sort of, uh, you know, uh, metrics and and value and things that is computed during training and often often guides the training. Um, but I would argue there's actually more to it than that, and there's more nuance to what is a test. And so this is this is a, a kind of a drum that I like to beat is, um, you know, if you look at testing on traditional software, there's all sorts of interesting things. It's not just top of line pass fail or top of line you know percent accuracy uh, there's things like unit tests and so why aren't there unit tests in the machine learning world because um, it might not be that I just want 90 percent accuracy on my whole data set uh, you know I also want to make sure that for subsets of that data set maybe it's a subpopulation of my group or, or just you know particular uh, parts of the data that have a different input distribution how do you ensure that those continue to perform well uh, as you update the model and, and as the data evolves um, so I think that there's absolutely room for things like that of you know running unit tests against machine learning to make sure um, that things like that. Uh, integration tests, smoke tests, um, performance tests and stress tests. You know, how, how do you know that, it, how, what is the throughput? How can you uh, ensure that, uh, you know, it's going to be able to handle, you know, X many requests per second? Are you filling the pipeline of your GPU or are you passing just one uh, inference in each time and, and massively underutilizing uh, your GPU in that case? Uh, there's a lot of things that go into that. And again, don't have time in this talk to go into all of them, but I think that just asking ourselves, you know, hey, what are some of these lessons that have been learned in traditional software and how can we make machine learning better? I think there's a lot of opportunities there. Um, 
auditability and governance. You know, again, you know, thinking how how do you get insight out of this? Are your models emitting uh, meaningful metrics in addition to you know the answer that they're outputting? Um, and can you access those in a in a system systematic way? Um, there's you know model drift. So even if you don't uh, well, there's there's very there's data drift and there's model drift and th there's other kinds of drift and all that. But uh, you know, just kind of visual example, uh, you know, maybe you trained your model in the summer. Um, this was kind of a real example we did as as a demo. Was that we worked with a, f a clothing company on a fashion detector algorithm, and uh, you know, so we we took a bunch of the data, we we trained up a classifier on it to recognize things like shirts and pants, etc. Um, but then you wait a couple months, and it goes from summer to winter, and all of a sudden uh, that classifier that had you know 90 whatever percent accuracy no longer works because it's not, the data has fundamentally changed even if you haven't made a single new commit uh, or, or change anything in your model uh, and so that's something that's a little bit different than traditional software where if I do a git push and you know I change the code and I run the tests those tests are probably going to just keep passing forever into the future because nothing changes but with again with machine learning you know your input distribution might change uh, you know your, your model might your model might drift. There, there's all sorts of things in, in that regard. Um, and then, you know, there's also uh, a lot of thought leadership going now on now in the DevOps space of, you know, what's the best practices around logging for, for web applications? You know, how do I do monitoring? How do I get alerted when things are going wrong? Um, and observability is even deeper of, you know, how can I answer questions after the fact uh, about, you know, why things happen the way that they did. Um, you know, this also starts to touch on explainability uh, in machine learning, but I think it's also distinct. Um, so, okay, so those, that was, you know, drawing some analogy to uh, between traditional software, what are some of the differences with that in machine learning? Um, and, you know, how, how, do, how do I think about this sort of problem? You know, machine learning is a very new space. And so, you know, being able to draw analogy is really powerful in that. So. Why is it that, uh, you know, what's the source of some of these problems? Like, why is machine learning uh, behind the curve when it comes to DevOps and, and these sort of best practices? Um, well, I would argue that there's a couple things that, that go into it, and we'll dive more deeply into uh, each of these. Um, so, uh, it's, well, sorry, slide a little out of the way. So what are, what are kind of some of the things that, you know, we see firsthand uh, as the, the things that, you know, we, we work with a lot of customers, we talk with a, a lot of enterprises that are working to build their ML strategy um, and, and their tooling and their infrastructure and figure out how they can make that effective for them. Um, and so we see a lot of anti-patterns uh, which, which tend to come up. Um, one of them stuck in the lab. Um, so, a company will invest in hiring some data scientists, some ML engineers. Um, you know, they'll they'll potentially build things like innovation centers and, and, and things like that uh, to to try to pursue this because they recognize that there's value in ML. Um, but it, this can often be a trap um, where it's easy to um, have people, you know, playing with data, building models, things like that. Um, but if you don't have the right uh, alignment and, and uh, connections in with the rest of the company, uh, it's very easy for those projects not to go anywhere. And that's why we talk to a lot of companies and there, there's data out there and surveys of, you know, a lot of companies haven't even gotten their first model into production. And that can often be a, a sort of a symptom of this where it's, you know, they might have data scientists, they might be building models, but if they're not actually getting into production, that, that means that it's getting stuck in the lab and that's a big problem. Um, Oftentimes that can happen because the right people are not talking to each other. Um, sometimes that's asking data scientists to build infrastructure. Um, and fundamentally, it's a very different problem. Um, you know, that, and that they're both interesting and, and require expertise. But, you know, if I spend, you know, 10 years of my life learning uh, to be the best DevOps engineer that I can, or I spend, you know, decades learning uh, to be the best ML engineer and learning all the, the, the art and the science and, and the math behind, uh, you know, deep learning and, and and you know regression and all these things you know that's not the same skill set as building a reliable scalable system and so asking those people to do them uh, can often be a recipe for problems um, 
additionally, you know, not talking to the business owners, um, you know, the, the, or the, you know, the, the users or the product owners. Um, again, you know, if you don't want to get stuck in the lab, you need to make sure that it's going to have an impact on the product. And again, this is, you know, in my mind, this is existential for, for our industry is making sure that we do get out of the lab and have an impact on the business. Um, and understanding who's responsible for these things. Different organizations have different structures um, and there's not a right or wrong one, frankly, but understanding those, having a process and understanding who's responsible because if you don't know who's responsible for what, then there's this, this abdication of responsibility uh, where you know maybe a data scientist doesn't want to go build a Kubernetes cluster in order to deploy their work. Um, or you know, there's, there's question of who owns the budget for that and how do you, how do you get authorization to actually pay for things? Because it's pretty easy to, to do a lot of the first stages of data science on, on a laptop with free open source software. Uh, but as soon as you need to go host and produce it, uh, you know, there's definitely going to be infrastructure. And frankly, there's probably going to be software costs too if you want to have the best solution for your problem. Um, and fundamentally, there's also a lot of technology uh, questions um, of just, you know, how do you choose the best technology for this? And it's a very fast evolving industry. Uh, so, uh, you know, even just the frameworks from a couple of years ago when it was all uh, TensorFlow, TensorFlow, TensorFlow. Um, you know, nowadays PyTorch probably arguably has, has the majority of the mind share. It's certainly in the research uh, side of things and, and you know, and, and community sentiment. Um, and so who's to say what that's going to be one year, two years, three years from now? Uh, and that, that even just that decision, uh, that, that cognitive overhead can be inhibiting to, to adoption. Um, so I think maintaining some flexibility because you don't want to tie the hands of your data scientists and, and your engineers, um, but you do need to have some opinions and you do need to make those decisions and keep moving forward. Even if they're not perfect, um, you know, you don't want the enemy, the perfect to be the enemy of the good. Um, you know, stakeholder buy-in, uh, kind of mentioned that already. Um, and then just broadly speaking, lack of process. You know, a, a lot of times it's just, you know, you ask somebody, hey, what is your process for going from a model that was trained by a data scientist in your organization to, you know, hooking that in and getting that up? A lot of people just don't even have an answer for that. And, you know, that's something that, again, with traditional software, companies have to figure out as they as they mature and as, as an organization. Um, and I would argue that, you know, you need to put that same thought uh, and deliberateness into it. Um, and, I, you know, that's kind of what this whole conference is about. So I'm really encouraged to see that. Um, you know, broadly speaking, um, ML is in a huge growth phase. That's, it's very exciting. Um, I love how excited the world is and the investment into that. Um, but, you know, again, it, it's lagging behind on some of the sort of the practical realities of this. Uh, and so that that's where, you know, I think as an industry, there's, there's a lot of opportunity for improvement there. And again, it's just, we want this to be successful. Like this is, uh, you know, the, the closest crocodile to the canoe. This is going to be the thing that sinks us in a certain sense if we don't deal with it immediately as an industry. Um, running a little bit low on time, but I will say that, you know, again, going back to the idea of it being a trap and there being hid hidden technical debt, it's not necessarily hard to get your first model up in production. Um, Making make a VM image, make an AMI, add it to an auto scaling group. You, you know you're off to the races. One person can do that in an afternoon. Uh, but what happens when you have your next model? Do you create a new auto scaling group and you know do a rolling deploy? What happens if you want to call back you know a couple versions and see see what those are going to do? What happens when you want to add your second model and now there's no consistency between them? Or you do add your second model but you didn't update the scripts for the first one? Um, these are sort of the, the hidden technical debt uh, that, that can catch up on you. Google wrote a really good paper on this uh, about hidden technical debt specifically. Um, and so Finally, you know, kind of take home points, considerations for ML in the enterprise. And by enterprise, I just mean in business, getting, getting return on investment, you know, proving the value in these tools that, that we all love and believe in so much. Um, and so, you know, one, uh, the biggest thing I would probably say, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, you know, this, this tweet kind of sums it up pretty well, in my opinion, like we talked to a lot of companies and there's a lot of teams in there that are just a bit too excited about building their own solution for this. And, you know, and I, I get it, like, you know, it's interesting problem space and there's a lot that goes into it, but it's really easy to think that it's going to be easier than it is or, or forget about some of these nuance that's going to come in later. And, you know, you're going to either be on the hook for building, um, or, you know, you're going to have to, to, to figure out, you know, what you're going to do instead. Um, so, you know, again, if there's one takeaway from this talk, it's that 
doing machine learning is not the same thing as doing production machine learning that's having an impact on, on business and, and the world. And we've spent two plus decades learning these best practices the hard way in software engineering and in DevOps, and there's conferences and talks all around the world going about these things. And I think that we as an industry could really benefit to like open our eyes, look at some of those things and ask ourselves, you know, yes, it's a new industry and it's greenfield and like nobody knows where it's going, but that doesn't mean we don't have a map. Uh, we can look at traditional software and see, you know, how, what, let's take the best parts of that, you know, forget the parts that don't make sense, but you know, I think that there's a lot of room for improvement for us as an industry. So pick the right tools for the job and, uh, you know, make ML successful. Um, so that's what I got. Um, thank you. There's, there's some further reading here. Um, you know, uh, Ian Chow, I think, really like nails the sort of issue of the existential risk to machine learning. And as I said, uh, Google has some really good uh, discuss talks about the hidden technical debt, and uh, the, the roadmap to machine learning maturity has some good data uh, backing up this, the the things I'm saying. So, thanks everyone. Yeah, thanks, Kenny. That was a great talk. So uh, there's a lot of interest in the chat as well. You can see there's some of these uh, questions in there. So feel free to jump through that. Uh, there's another talk coming up in about a minute, but everyone can feel free to stay on um, and, and continue the discussion. Yeah, absolutely. I'll start reading through those. Um, and yeah, sorry, I ran a little long there. I'll be still on the video though. So I'll try to get through all the questions if, I, if people want to stick around um, or feel free to just email um, info at Algorithmia or Kenny at Algorithmia, uh, happy, happy to address anything there. I'll start reading through some of the questions now. <laughs> um, to the people asking about the deck, yes, the, the deck will be made available. Um, you know, I was making last minute edits up to last night, but uh, it's, uh, I'll, I'll absolutely make that available. And again, just email if uh, anybody can't find that, it's all open information. So happy to share that. Um, some people talking about uh, some of the different tools and services, ECS, Fargate, et cetera. Um, so yeah, again, you know, there, there's a lot of tools and things out there that, that are great. Um, they're in many cases not machine learning specific and that can lead to some challenges, but you know, absolutely by all means, uh, you know, ch check out those tools and, and use what you can off the shelf. Um, Got it. Okay, so there's a really good question here about um, question. What do you think of using standard code.py files instead of IPython notebooks for training a model? Um, this way, the team can collaborate, but it's not that convenient for a data scientist. Um, so I, I think it can work different. You know, at different organizations can do it differently. I actually think that for the training phase, it does make a ton of sense to stay in an IPython notebook, a Jupyter notebook, uh, because it is often interactive. It's, it's exploratory. Um, and you want to be able to go back and, you know, change one step without having to rerun the whole notebook start to finish. Um, you know, with software development, there's a pretty widely accepted uh, thing, which is that the shorter you can make that feedback loop, uh, you know, the more effective a developer is. If I have to push to get and then wait for a CI job to complete over 10 minutes and all that before I get feedback of whether my code change was good or not, that's going to make me much, much less productive as a developer than if I can just, you know, run tests locally and, and iterate that way. So I think there's an analogy there with, with a Jupyter notebook. Um, and you can run a Jupyter notebook like a Python notebook. Um, I forget the exact command line, but you can basically just treat it as a Python file in a certain sense. Um, so I think you can run that on the back end that way as well. Um, there's a subtle nuance there where, you know, may, if you're doing nightly retraining jobs, you know, that might not be a situation to run in a Jupyter notebook, but, you know, again, it kind of depends on the situation. Um, cool. Uh, let's see, scrolling down. Um, best model version control technology you've experienced. Uh, I, I'm just going to selfishly say Algorithmia. Um, you know, we, we keep every version of every model. We actually link it to the, the Git source repository where if you do a Git push, um, we build that model and we, we tag it by the Git hash. So you can call the API directly uh, based on the Git hash uh, and, you know, going back in any version in history. Uh, and so, you know, that, that I think that there's, there's some niceness there, but, you know, I'm not unbiased. Um, Let's see, sort of final question. Any way to get the IPython more development friendly and examples? Uh, yeah, you know, again, um, I think just thinking about it 
where, you know, even if you do it interactively as you're doing it, making it so that at the end of the day, you can just run your notebook from start to finish and that the output of that notebook is going to be your trained model file. Um, I think that's a really good best practice um, for, for building your notebooks rather than assuming that it'll be a person going through and, and you know, like looking at it. Um, so yeah, I think there's absolutely best practices there, but you know, it, it's just, it wasn't the focus of Jupyter Notebook, right? Like, you know, they're focused on that interactive uh, thing. And so I think that they're getting better, but there's a lot of room for improvement there. Um, thank you for the question. Um, and yeah, people talking about Jupyter plugins and all that, which, uh, you know, there's probably people much more expert than me on that. Uh, and then, so the, the question, uh, final question, I guess, about the two git flow system, um, so again, you know, this is just something that, that I've kind of proposed and I've started to see some of it in the industry, but it's just recognizing the fact that, you know, you have two distinct code bases. Uh, there's one for training and the code for actually running the inference is different. And so having a separate Git repo, it, it's, I think there's a certain analogy to like, you know, the migration towards microservices and, and not having a giant mono repo and having things track distinctly. Um, you know, look, there, there's certainly pros and cons of different approaches. Uh, you know, I don't think there's a right or wrong one, but asking that question and having an opinion about that, I think uh, it, it can go a long way. Cause again, it's not, it's not what system, you know, using the Git flow system versus other, you know, uh, Git, Git management systems. Like, I don't think that it's right or wrong to choose one or the other. It's just have something, have an opinion, have something, you know, and, and that's really key. Um, cool. Let's see. Any other questions? It doesn't sound like single flow can work for all deployment types. Um, sorry, Heathcliff Lewis or Lewis. Um, could you maybe give a little bit more uh, detail what you mean by that? A batch batch type workflows, um, yeah. So the, yeah, that's a, often a big question is you know batch workflow or real time type workflows, um, and you know there's look I, I don't want to overgeneralize because there's a very wide variety of ML workflows and and, and workloads, um, but this batch versus real time question is a very common one. Um, I'm definitely a big believer in if you have a scalable elastic system, um, you can treat batch and real time in largely the same way, which has a lot of benefit because there's often situations where I want to do batch jobs. Maybe I want to run against all the historical data uh, against the model, but I also have live uh, incoming requests and, and events happening and I want to classify them or, or recognize anomalies or, or whatever the situation might be. So if you can have a system um, that, you know, you containerize your workload it can scale up dynamically uh, and manage priority of workloads so that, you know, you can have a batch workload that runs over the course of, you know, five hours, uh, but it's not overwhelming your scheduler and it's not interrupting your, your real-time workloads. Um, that can be pretty compelling. But there's other situations where, you know, you don't, maybe you don't need the real-time and then you might architect the system a little bit differently. But yeah, no, I think that's absolutely what, one of the key questions to be asking uh, early on when you're when you're designing and asking the question, you know, what does ML look like at my company? Great. Um, well, and I apologize if I missed any in the chat or anything like that. As I said, I'm I'm more than happy to uh, you know answer by email or or anything else. Uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, look forward to going and attending some of the the sessions uh, for the rest of the conference. Thanks, everyone.